So it's just a real distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Maria Grazia Roncarolo for the Outstanding uh, Investigator Award. I've known Maria Grazia uh, since 2000. That was when I was first introduced to her. I was asked, uh, I was part of a site visit team that visited uh, Milan and, and Tijet, and Maria Grazia had just taken over as the leader of that program. And I remember the impression of the site visit team was one of just, wow, what a leader. And, and so I just want to give you a little bit of background about Maria Grazia. Uh, she was trained clinically in pediatrics and bone marrow transplantation. And in the lab, uh, her focus was on molecular genetics and immunology. And after initial studies, uh, using gene marking studies for ADA deficiency showed that the procedure worked, she made two seminal adva advancements to that approach. One, she used a non-myeloablative conditioning to create a niche for those stem cells, those trans cells. And she did not keep patients on PEG ADA so that there was uh, a selective advantage for the gene-corrected cells over the non-gene-corrected cells. And these studies resulted in children surviving and living free of infections from ADA SCID and other deficiencies for years. I believe many of you that have been to these meetings over the years remember the presentation by the father of one of the children with ADA SCID. He described the experience of his life, of experiencing his son's life as witnessing two births, once when the son was born and once again after gene therapy. Notably, the ADA SCID product was approved by the European Medicine Agency in 2016. Dr. Roncarola also directs research into mechanisms underlying immune tolerance. She's made seminal discoveries in that field and she understood early on for gene therapy to be successful you need to build a critical mass of investigators to successfully conduct the trials and lead the translation from animals to humans. She built the group in Milan into a powerhouse uh, through internal training, development of young investigators, and by the successful recruitment of talented mid-level investigators such as Dr. Luigi Naldini. The list of her trainees is long and remarkable. These includes Dr. Biffy, Dr. Ayudi, and Dr. Bacchetta. Now at Stanford University as Division Chief for Pediatric Cell Transplantation and Regeneration Medicine and co-director of the Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Mes Medicine, she's continuing in her groundbreaking research. Please help me welcome and congratulate Maria Grazia Roncarola on her impressive past and current research endeavors. Thank you Bev, for the uh, very kind introduction. And I would like to thank the committee and the SGT for this incredible honor. Um, I cannot think about a better year to get this award. We have a female president, Cynthia Dunbar. I was introduced by an outstanding female investigator. Beth Davidson, and I am the second woman after Cathy Hyde to receive this award. And it's wonderful to be second after Cathy. So thank you so much. So I have uh, no disclosure, and uh, I must admit that I'm a little bit emotional to give this talk, because this is really the journey of my professional life, to search for a cure for children <coughs> with primary immune deficiencies. But it is also a personal journey around the world to look for this cure. And the journey started when I was uh, indeed a medical student back in Turin. At that time, uh, these children were called the bubble boys. And we didn't know <coughs> much about these children, except 
that they have a very common clinical phenotype. They were born healthy, but soon after birth, they were devastated by infection with viruses that normally are very unharmful. So if you don't take care of these children, and at that time we didn't have a way to take care of these children, they died in the first year of life. And if we manage to have them surviving, they eventually develop maternal graft resistance disease, very severe autoimmunity and cancer, and they have a characteristic failure to thrive. So in those years, we learned to do hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, indeed bone marrow transplantation, from an HLA identical sibling. But unfortunately, in more than 70% of the cases in these patients, we did not have an HLA identical sibling. So the only option we had left was really to put them on palliative therapy. So I decided to move to Lyon, and I don't say the year, because otherwise it really shows my age. But um, we tried to cure this patient with fetal stem cells. Fetal stem cells from fetal liver, and we cured these patients, sometimes, not very often, when we treat them after birth, and we also successfully treat them in utero. Actually, the first in utero transplant was performed in Lyon in the late 80s. But in the few cases in which the fetal liver stem cell transplant worked, what we saw was an experiment of nature. Because in these patients, we always achieved tolerance despite the complete mismatch between the fetal liver stem cells and the host. And there was never full donor chimerism. So in this split chimera, we saw that the donor-derived T cells tolerized the host. So this was very intriguing and indeed, in 94, at the next research institute, we showed that these cells produce very high level of IL-10. And believe it or not, human IL-10 was cloned from the cells of one of these kid patients transplanted in Lyon. And later on, we characterized these cells, and we showed that these cells indeed play a key role in immunological homeostasis and in suppressing undesired immune responses. But indeed, in this skid patient was the first demonstration the tier one cells, as we call these cells, T regulatory type one, exist and mediate transplantation tolerance. Now, this fetal liver stem cell transplant didn't work at all for ADA skid. Because indeed, ADA skid is a very complex immunodeficiency. Not only you have a complete block in the differentiation of the lymphoid lineages because of the lack of the enzyme, the adenosine deaminases, with a profound deficiency in NK, T, and B cells, but you also have a metabolic disease because of the accumulation of the toxic metabolite. And this leads really to tissue alteration with severe alteration in the brain, bones, liver, kidney, etc. So these children are very difficult to transplant. And still today, if we do not have an HL identical bone marrow sibling, it's a challenge to transplant these patients. But in those days, in the early days, we had a possibility to treat this patient with enzyme replacement therapy. Indeed, the pegylated form of bovine ADA. Now, this is a kind of good, useful therapy, but it's not a cure. And in addition to that, many patients do not respond, and many patients had side effects because of the therapy, not to talk about the incredible cost of this therapy for this patient. So in the early 90s, indeed, these were the first patients treated with gene therapy because they were the only skid patient in, we, in whom we knew the genetic mutation. And the first experiment of gene therapy were really taking the lymphocytes that were generated in these patients thanks to the enzyme replacement therapy, treat these lymphocytes in vitro with retroviral, gamma retroviral vector and reinfuse the cells. And indeed, the first trial was conducted in at the NIH by Mark Blaze, but in Europe was indeed at the Sarah Fale Institute. And you may recognize some of the people in this picture. They are quite young. Um, 
Claudio Bordignon, Giuliano Ferrari, and Fulvio Maviglia. So the lesson we learned from this gene therapy in PBL was indeed the procedure was safe, and we also saw that the, the correct T cells had an advantage in survival. But we had a very low level of gene marking, around 0.1, 10% in the best case scenario, and it was clear that these patients were not detoxified. So they still needed to remain on pegylated ADA. And indeed, when I joined TGET in 1998, one of these patients was so sick because of the side effect of pegylated ADA that we decided to taper down the enzyme replacement therapy very slowly. But what we learn when we taper down the pegylated ADA, as you can see in these slides, is that progressively the transduced lymphocytes, which were in the higher range of 80%, 8%, 10%, they became 100% of the lymphocyte in the circulation. So this was clear that these cells had a tremendous advantage when you remove the pegylated ADA. Also, we showed that these cells produce very high level of, peg of, uh, of the enzyme and were fully functional. So this was a very important information for us because it clearly showed that if you remove PEG-EDA, you create a selective advantage in the expansion and survival of the corrected cells, but at the same time, it showed that this was not enough and that we didn't have the critical mass of cells sufficient to produce the enzyme and to detoxify the body of these children. So the next step was quite obvious, and it was to go for stem cells with the idea that if we engineer the hematopoietic stem cells, these cells will not only correct the immunodeficiency, but have the gene in all the hematopoietic lineages producing the correct enzyme and detoxifying the body. So the protocol we used is illustrated in this slide. It's quite straightforward. We, gener we harvest the bone marrow from the patients. We purify the CD34 positive cells, activate them with cytokines, transduce them with retroviral vector. We went through three cycles of transduction. This is the classical vector from the very first trial designed by Giuliana Ferrari. And we reinfuse the cells but we introduced, as Bev said, two major variations. We gave low doses of chemotherapy. This was quite challenging because ADA skid patients are very susceptible to chemotherapy, so we had to go for really low doses. But we knew that we needed to open the bone marrow niches to give some advantage to the correct stem cells. And also we gave the gene therapy not under the umbrella of pegylated ADA, but we suspended the enzyme replacement therapy prior to the gene therapy. So this was the key of success for this trial. And indeed, what we saw is that in the peripheral uh, blood, we had 100% of corrected CD3, B cells, NK, but importantly, what we saw in the peripheral blood we saw also granulocytes that were corrected. And of course, the level of correction was not comparable to the 100% we saw in the lymphoid lineages, was around 5%, 8%, depending on the patient, but still was a clear indication that we corrected the stem cells and we had multi-lineage engraftment of the corrected cells. Importantly, what we could show is that in this patient, we had full immune reconstitution. The T cells progressively increase in the peripheral blood slowly. So to reach a normal level of T cells, CD4, CD8, we needed more than one year. But eventually, we also had the normal B and NK cells. And importantly, we showed clearly indication that the stem cells, the corrected stem cells, migrated to the thymus, repopulated the thymus, and gave a normal thymopoiesis. So what was very important was, of course, to demonstrate the rationale of the stem cell gene therapy, that we also corrected the metabolic diseases, and indeed, the toxic metabolite dropped substantially, and we had an increase in weight and height in this patient. And interestingly, 
The first indication that the gene therapy works is that this patient start to gain weight again. So the failure to thrive, which is the hallmark of the disease, is gone if gene therapy succeeds. So these, these data were published in 2009, and I would like to thank our colleague Fabio Candotti and Don Kahn for doing the editorial and say gene therapy fulfills its promise. So it was very rewarding for us. Thank you, Don. So I want to say Translational research in stem cell gene therapy or in any field needs a team. And this was really a team effort of more than 20 people. But I want to show in these slides the key players. Of course, Claudio, Fulvio, Giuliana I already mentioned, but I would like to point out Alessandra Uti, who at that time was a young doctor and absolutely motivated to cure this patient. And of course, the fact that we could recruit to the Teleton Institute for Gene Therapy, Luigi Naldini, was a coup. So we treated 18 patients. And on these 18 patients, we basically saw that 15 were completely cured. We had 100% survival. We had three patients that had restarted pegylated ADA because the number of cells we gave were not sufficient to achieve cure. And also, two of these patients underwent later on allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. But overall, these data were quite impressive. We have a follow-up which is more than 6.9 years, and I would say that this was really the first demonstration of successful cure for ADA skid. So, this was indeed the results. We were very fortunate that GSK took licensed the product and committed to bring the product to marketing and commercialization. And now the product under the name of Streamvalis is available for every patient in need, which is exactly what we want to achieve in gene therapy. Uh, later on, uh, Alessandro and his team treated more than 22 patients. Actually now the count is 23 because the first patient treated with the commercialized stream valis was just treated a couple of weeks ago. And overall, the results look really impressive. We didn't see any uh, leukemia transformation. We didn't see, I have a water leaking here. Uh, we didn't see any leukemia transformation. We saw clearly multilineage engraftment and long-term engraftment with immune reconstitution. And of course, uh, now they have a long-term registry really to monitor this patient for more than 15 years. Now, the journey took more than 20 years. Actually, the first patient we treated with stem cell gene therapy was in 2000, and 16 years to reach commercialization. So it was a long journey. But the good news is that what we learned from this journey really instructed what we did next. And what we learned was clearly that we needed to have efficient and stable gene transfer. We needed to have an adequate dose of corrected hematopoietic stem cells, otherwise we didn't make it. We need to have a selective advantage, either in the expansion uh, or in the engraftment of the stem cells by giving the chemotherapy, but also a selective advantage in the differentiated cells. And finally, we need to have an efficient expression of the therapeutic gene. What we also learned were the potential risk. And the first risk was, of course, insertional mutagenesis mediated by re the retroviral vector. But the other thing we also learned is that if you don't give an adequate dose of the correct stem cells, you don't make it to cure the child. The child goes back to Pegadier or to bone marrow transplant. But the insertional mutagenesis was really a major problem. And indeed, while we were conducting this trial, parallel trials, the trial of Marina Cavazzana in Paris, in, in the skid x one the IL-2 receptor gamma chain deficiency, showed five cases of leukemia. And at that time was really a major drawback for us because our trial was put on hold and we had some delay, et cetera. So the 16 years were also due to that. But later on, what we found out is that not only in the ADA skid, but also in other trials, the use of the retroviral vectors led to malignant transformation. 
And unfortunately, in a trial conducted in Germany, we saw that nine out of the 10 patients treated with Viscotaldo syndrome developed leukemia, and also in chronic granulomatose disease, there was an expansion of a clone and myelodysplasia. So these data were really concer a concern for us. Now, the good news is that in the ADA skid, we didn't see any leukemic transformation. And now there are more than 40 patients treated worthwhile. So there is something different in the ADA skid. We still don't know if it's related to the transgene, if it's related to the vector, if it's related to the protocol. But it was clear, based on the data from our colleague, that we had to move uh, out and go forward to the lentiviral vector. And of course, you know, for TGET to move to the lentiviral vector was an obvious choice because of the recruitment of a pioneer in the lentiviral vector, Luigi Naldini. And uh, it was already known that the lentiviral vector indeed have a safer integration profile and have a higher gene trans transfer efficiency into a dematopoietic stem cell. So it was an obvious choice to go to trials with stem cells using lentiviral vector. So I decided that I would try to cure with stem cell gene therapy with Cotagy syndrome. Now, when I decided to do that, one of my colleagues, Claudio, said, you choose the wrong disease. And indeed, it's a very complex disease because the lack of the Wiscotaldrich protein impairs not only the lymphoid lineages, but every single cell in the metopoietic system. Because the WAS protein is a key protein in the cytoskeletal reorganization of the cells. So in principle, when you do a stem cell gene therapy and you have the ambition to cure the patient, you have to correct many lineages in addition to the lymphoid lineages. And specifically, you have to correct the megakaryocyte because the clinical phenotype of these patients is in addition to the immunodeficiency, a very severe thrombocytopenia because of the lack of the WASP protein. And also, these patients have very severe autoimmunity with dysregulation in the TH1 axis and severe eczema and hyper-IgE because of dysregulation in the TH2 axis. So a very complex disease. But, you know, we embark in many preclinical trials, which are all listed here at the bottom of these slides, many people involved, also our colleague in Geniton. And finally, after eight years, we were ready to start the trial. And the first patient was treated in 2010. So we got permission to treat eight patients, and to, the study objective was, of course, to show their safety, the biological activity, the efficacy. The inclusion criteria were quite strict. We had to go for severe WASP mutation for patients that didn't have an HL identical sibling or an unrelated match donor. And we decided to use, after many preclinical studies, the endogenous promoter of the WASP to give some regulation to the WASP expression. And finally, the trial uh, had a three years follow-up with a long-term follow-up study after that. So the first eight patients are illustrated here. Uh, indeed, um, these were patients with quite severe score of the disease, all above three. They all had quite severe thrombocytopenia. The age was different. Uh, there were some young patients, and the last two patients were quite older. And the follow-up now for the first patient is 6.5 years. And Alessandra Uti treated three additional WASP patients under the hospital exemption program. So the results of this trial were quite compelling. Because not only we show that with the lentiviral vector, we had a very significant engraftment of the corrected stem cells, around 50%, stable over several months and year, but also we had basically 100% correction between 80 and 100% correction in the lymphocytes, and we had also correction in the platelets. Now, the platelets were, was a challenge because we never reach a normal level of platelets, but we had a significant increase in the number of the platelets and a significant increase in the volume of the platelets. And importantly, the prediction we had that no myeloblative conditioning would be sufficient to have engraftment of the corrected platelets was correct because we could show 
the dysplatelets had a selective advantage in the peripheral blood. So when you look at the level of the platelets corrected, expressing the WASP protein in the bone marrow, is significantly lower than the level you find in the peripheral blood, clearly indicating a selective advantage, which we think is mostly a selective advantage in survival. So importantly, there was a dramatic clinical benefit to this stem cell gene therapy. The patient stopped bleeding. You see that the bleeding basically stopped right after gene therapy. And also the recurrent infection that required hospitalization and aggressive treatment decreased progressively. What you can see is that this decrease was really significant after two years. So basically the immune system took at least two years really to reset and be functional to fight infection. We also took care of the immunodysregulation. We saw that in many of these patients, the um, sign of autoimmunity disappeared after stem cell gene therapy. Also in one case of severe autoimmunothrombocytopenia, we could treat that successfully, and we had less circulating autoantibody, clearly indicated that we reset a normal Th1 response. But also we reset a normal Th2 response in these patients because the eczema really disappeared, with the exception of patient number eight that had still some sign. So overall, the summary is that also for this disease, which as I said at the beginning is a quite complex disease, stem cell gene therapy was well tolerated with high level of hematopoietic stem cell gene correction thanks to the lentiviral vector, multilineage engraftment, no really uh, safety concern, improved immunofunction, improved prater function, and now all these patients are in a long-term safety and efficacy study. So the take-home message is that really this was a TG, the first lentiviral vector trial brought to the clinic together with the metachromatic leukodystrophy with the Alessandra Biffy and clearly showed that the lentiviral vector were much safer than the retroviral vector. We have no insertional mutagenesis and we have a much higher frequency of retroviral vector um, than retroviral vector. And of course, this approach has been used now for many diseases in addition to primary immunodeficiency, including the recent beautiful results of Giuliana Ferrari in beta thalassemia and many other world, um, groups around the world. Now, I want to talk about a new primary immunodeficiency, actually a new class of primary immunodeficiency that we will see more and more in the coming years. So these are primary immunodeficiency in which the monogenic defect is not in the adaptive immune response, but in the regulatory response. So we call them T regopathies. And indeed, I already told you that T regulatory cells play a key role in immunological homeostasis in preventing allergy, autoimmunity, inflammatory, uh, chronic inflammatory diseases, and so on. And we know that there are many classes of T regulatory cells, but what I showed you in this picture are the three major populations that have been best characterized in the mouse and the human. The thymic derived T regulatory cells, which have a transcription factor FOXP3, which is the master regulator for these cells. The TR1 cells that I already mentioned to you before, the peculiarity of the TR1 cells is that they are induced in the peripheral blood and they are antigen specific. And we also have a population of peripheral FOXP3 Treg, for which we still don't know what the repertoire is and the antigen specificity. But if you have a defect in a single gene, which is fundamental for the function of these T regulatory cells, like for example, a mutation in the FOXP3, but also a mutation in STAT5, in CD25, in CTLA4, IL-10, IL-10 receptor, and so on, you have a genetic autoimmunity, very severe, very severe type 1 diabetes, very severe inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune pancytopenia, and very dysregulated immune response with severe allergy and eczema. And in addition to that, these patients have also immunodeficiency. So this is a new class 
of primary immunodeficiency that we need to think about when we think about gene therapy. And the best example of this immunodeficiency is, of course, the IPEX syndrome due to FOXP3 mutation. So in these patients, for many years, pediatricians call this patient IPEX, immunodysregulation, polyendocrinopathy, enteropathy, X-linked, because they didn't know the gene. So later on, they found out that this was due to a mutation in the FOXP3. So the classical clinical phenotype of this patient is different from the bubble boy because they have severe autoimmunity. Sometimes they have type 1 diabetes in utero or when they are born, and they have severe enteropathy, which usually is fatal in the first year of life. And if they manage to live under immunosuppression, they develop a whole series of other symptoms and autoimmune manifestation. Now, these patients are very difficult to transplant because they have a lot of activated T cells. And what Rosa Bacchetta did, first at TGET and now at Stanford, is really to characterize these patients. She had now an international survey in the States and in Europe, and she clearly showed that in these patients, the mutation in the FOXP3 not only leads to an impaired Treg function, but also lead to really a profound dysregulation in the immune system with increased frequency of Th17 cells in addition to the Th1 and Th2. And now there are more than 64 mutations characterized and described in the literature. So we cannot approach this disease with stem cell gene therapy with FOXP3 and lentiviral vector. If you put a lentiviral vector in the stem cell of this patient, the stem cells stop growing. So this is a typical example where you need a better regulation of the transgene to correct. But what we could do is to correct the T cells. And indeed, we published already a couple of years ago that you can take the T cells from the peripheral blood of these patients, transduce them in vitro with the third generation lentiviral vector encoding for the human FOXP3 uh, and under the EF1 alpha promoter and encoded for a marker gene, the delta NGFR under the minimal CMV promoter, purify the cells and characterize them. And what we showed by transducing the cells from five different IPEX patients is that we could reach a level of transduction which was quite significant, around 50%, with uh, two, three vector copy number per cells, and more importantly, we had significant expression of the FOXP3, which was quite comparable to the expression of the FOXP3 we could see in healthy donor, whereas the cells untransduced basically were completely knockout for FOXP3. So more importantly, we could show that these cells transduced with the lentiviral vectors were functional were functional in vitro, and they restore a suppressive function of the effector cells, so which was a very important validation that we can really restore regulatory function, and they suppress in vivo by protecting the human, in the humanized model, by protecting the mice from xenograft versus host disease. So the summary is that we can indeed use a gene therapy, a PBL gene therapy approach for FOXP3 mutation. We have a stable uh, gene transfer with stable expression. You need to reach very high stable expression to restore the function of the cells. If you have an expression that goes you know, up and down, you don't make it. So this is a very important point. But basically, we think that this LV-mediated overexpression of the wild-type FOXP3 can restore impaired Treg function in IPEX patients. So what is important is that now we want to take this approach to the clinic. And indeed, with ROSA, we think to file for an IND probably in the first quarter of 2018, if not earlier. But what I think is important is that this rare disease can be the entry door 
for a gene therapy approach in more common diseases. Indeed, we know that in type 1 diabetes or inflammatory bowel diseases, even when we don't have a FOXP3 mutation, we have impairment in the T regulatory cells. So if the trial in the IPEX patient, which again is a rare disease, shows that we can correct the type 1 diabetes and we can correct the enteropathy and we can correct all the other systemic autoimmune manifestation, we can use the same approach to treat autoimmune diseases which are not genetic. And this, I think, is really to broader the uh, use of stem cell and, and T cell gene therapy. Okay, so we can celebrate success. Yes and no. Yes, because we made a tremendous progress. Not because we still have major hurdles to make gene therapy with stem cells or T cells, a standard of care for every patient in need. And many hurdles include the immune response to the transgene, the fact that for many diseases, if you don't have a regulated expression of the transgene, sorry, I went, if you don't have a regulated expression of the transgene, you don't make it. Also, we have a major problem with the conditioning. There is no doubt that this full myeloblative condition that we need to give to diseases such as metachromatic leukodystrophy or other leukodystrophies or thalassemia, etc., is a problem because there is always autologous stem cell reconstitution and these are cells that have been exposed to the chemotherapy for the rest of the life of the patient. And last but not least, all these approaches are visible for diseases of the blood and the immune system but when you go for a primary immunodeficiency that involves tissue defect, like for example the D. George syndrome in which we have a thymic epithelial defect, this doesn't work. So many hurdles. And to overcome these hurdles, I decided to move to Stanford. And of course, you know, part of the equation was the gentleman that you see here, Herr Weissman, who invited me to be the co-director of this beautiful institute, the Stem Cell Institute, and he didn't take a no for an answer. He was very insistent. But um, what was wonderful was really to assemble a fantastic team of people at Stanford. And of course, you know, um, Matt Portius, you heard him speaking during this meeting, Judy Shizuro, David DiGiusto, and many people that we recently recruited, and I was lucky that Rosa Bacchetta moved with me to Stanford. So what are we doing? Well, we are building a center, and since we are aspirational, we call the center, Center for Definitive and Curative Medicine, to cure patients with stem cell and gene therapy and with cellular therapeutics. And we build the, all the infrastructure, and our goal is really to conduct the Stanford first in human clinical trials, and then to partner with industry to bring these trials and this product to commercialization. And the four areas in which we are really focusing are described in these slides. I don't have time to go through all of that, but I want to give you a flavor. Induction of tolerance, genome editing, antibody-based conditioning to replace chemotherapy, and the use of IPS for tissue-specific correction and cure of non-blood disorders. Let me tell you what we are doing for the induction of tolerance. I spoke during many times now about TRAG. So the concept we want to bring to the clinic is that if we give cell therapy with TRAG and we switch the balance between the effector cells and the TRAG, we can have a way to induce tolerance, not only in an allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation setting, but also in the gene therapy setting. Now, we work mostly with TR1 cells because these cells have the advantage to be antigen specific and we decided to push the first trial in an allogenic setting. And I'm going to show you the protocol, which is now a GMP validated protocol. I don't want to go into detail, but the message I want to give you is that we generate TR10 cells which contain TR1 cells that are donor derived and are specific for the host alloantigen. This is a phase one trial, so it's a dose escalation, 
but we could show that these TLO10 cells are very energetic and contain a significant proportion of fully differentiated TR1 cells and many progenitors of the TR1 cells. So this is, uh, as I said, the phase one. So we will enroll children, a young adult with leukemia and lymphoma who undergo a mismatch hematopoietic stem cell transplant. We will do a dose escalation a look at safety and feasibility, and the efficacy in this setting, which is the allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, is of course to look at prevention of graft versus host disease. But we will look also if we induce tolerance. And if we do induce tolerance, we can use the same product for gene therapy in setting where the response to the transgene or the viral vector impairs the clinical benefit. So the second approach is, of course, genome editing. And you know, I'm very fortunate to have Matt Portius, who is a pioneer in this field, in, my, in our team. And Matt has many programs on genome editing. The most advanced is in sickle cell anemia that will start the clinical trial next year. But what I want to show you is the work of Mara, a postdoc in Matt's lab that works on genome editing for SCIDX1, the IL-2 receptor gamma chain. And the approach she takes is to insert the old uh, IL-2 receptor gamma chain gene in the first intron. And quickly, what I sh want to show you is that she has quite significant indel, 80% high efficiency, uh, thanks to a major breakthrough that Endel did in the lab of Matt, but she also have quite good gene targeting, 45%. And more importantly, when she take the hematopoietic stem cells in which she did the gene targeting, she showed that these cells engrafted normally in a, a schedule mouse transplanted intrahepatically, and 28% of these engrafted cells express the IL-2 receptor gene and we had multi-lineage engraftment. So engraftment not only in the T cells, but also in the B cells and in the myeloid cells. So the conclusion, and I really invite you to go to the oral presentation of Mara tomorrow morning, Saturday morning, uh, but the conclusion of her work, and of course she has 20 slides on that, not three like me, is that she can really functionally correct the defect. And I still think that in the SCIDX1, we need regulated expression of the transgene because the IL-2 receptor gamma chain is highly regulated in the thymus during thymal poiesis. And definitely she has specificity of this correction and these data support moving for, towards a clinical trial. So I'm coming to the end. Last thing I want to show you very importantly, is to replace the, anti, the chemotherapy with an antibody-based conditioning. This can be transformational for the field of bone marrow transplantation, but also for the field of gene therapy. And this is the work of Judy Shizuro and um, uh, her Weisman and Agnieszka Czekanovic. She published the first paper in Science. What she showed is that when you use an anti-CD117 monoclonal antibody, you can open the mom marrow niches and allow the engraftment of allogenic cells. Um, the original work was in the mouse. Judy took it to the human, clearly showing that the human antibody works in vitro, but also in vivo, in the human eyes and the G mouse. And you clearly see a depletion of the human cells when you give the antibody. So we have a clinical trial. And I'm so honored to be the medical director of this clinical trial, which will use the CD117 monoclonal antibody in skid patients. So we have already treated one patient. This trial is a quite complex trial because the first patient will be treated when they need a secondary transplant, and then we will go to the patient identified with newborn screening. It's a safety trial, but also we want to show the myeloid engraftment and the functional lymphocyte after treating the patient with the antibody to open the bone marrow niches. It's exciting. It can be really transformational. Now, I, I'm at the end of my talk. I hope that I convince you that we popped the bubble. When my son was 
four years old. And I always showed him, him this bubble box. He always said, Mom, pop the bubble, pop the bubble. I think we did pop the bubble. And I'm very proud of that. Now, I have, I have to think that nothing of what I showed would have been possible without teamwork. And of course, I'm deeply in debt to Alessandra Uti, unfortunately, is not here today to celebrate with us, but is my successor in the clinical uh, unit. All the clinical team that we built from scratch, there was nothing at the Sarah failure when we started. Of course, Luigi Naldini, who re really took TJ to the next uh, generation, and I'm so proud of how fantastically they are doing and also Fabio Ciccio who helped me with accepting of all the clinical staff. Now, there are many people at TJ that I want to thank, but there are some people that they are very special to me. Rosa, Manuela, and Silvia Gregori who work with me with all the T-regulatory cells. I already mentioned many times Giuliana Ferrari with whom we started all the program of thalassemia and the bone marrow transplantation that really thought us how to move forward with the gene therapy. And Maria Sessa and Alessandra Biffi, the journey with the metachromatic diocletal dystrophy was simply fantastic. And I really was very fortunate to be part of that journey. And finally, I want to thank the people of my lab at Stanford. And last but not least, I want to thank the patients. And this gentleman here that I saw him last year at TGET, he said to me, Dottora, you don't know yet, but I'm going to be a doctor in the future. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maria Gracia, for that fantastic uh, journey through the ages and uh, f for the excitement that uh, the past research has brought and the new research is going to bring. The floor is um, open for any questions on, on any of the work. So I, I had a question about your uh, antibody approach, and I wondered if you could comment a little bit more about how you're thinking about using that if it works in the first group of patients, um, where so, you would go? Um, first of all, I think that Judy gave a, a talk today about the approach with the antibody alone or in combination with another antibody, CD47, uh, which is also a very interesting antibody. So this antibody works alone in patients with lymphopenia. So the idea we have is to give the antibody um, to patients, they need a secondary transplant because they received the first transplant without conditioning. And therefore, they didn't have a stem cell engraftment. They had only an engraftment of the lymphoid cells. So to, um, to have a stem cell engraftment, we, will give the anti we are giving the antibody. The first patient was treated recently, and we have a second patient you know, that already consented. The idea to give the antibody is really to open the bone marrow niches and then to come back with the same transplant from the original donor. So once we do a dose finding and we show safety and optimal doses, optimal pharmacokinetic, we will go to the newborn that are now um, identified by newborn screening. And indeed, this is a two-center trial, is Stanford and UCSF. So our collaborators at UCSF are the center for neonatal screening, and they identify this patient basically when they are newborns. Thank you. First of all, congratulations to, to the, for the award. But I had a question. There's been recent papers talking about um, amino acid uh, depletion being a conditioning regimen, um, basically um, being able to open up the niche with uh, taking out certain amino acids out of the diet. What do you, what do you think about that? And are, are you working on that as well? Well, that paper is from Iro Nakauchi, a member of the Stem Cell Institute. And, you know, we have been talking, of course, a lot about that because 
he thinks that that could be um, a very powerful approach, a safe approach. Um, there's still some tox studies to be done preclinically before that approach is mature for the clinic. But the way in which I see it is that in the next five, 10 years, there will be many approaches tested in the clinic on antibody-based conditioning or alternative conditioning like with the uh, amino acid substitution. And, and eventually we will find the best one and maybe there will not be a best universal conditioning regimen you know, with antibody or other drugs, we will have different for different diseases. But that's how the field should move. Because again, I think we should, we should really leave the chemotherapy behind. Hi, so when you switch from retrovirus to lentivirus, you, in your WAS trial, you really improve the safety, but you also change the promoter and you use an endogenous promoter. Do you think this also plays a role to increase the safety of the approach? Well, you know, there are many other trials ongoing at TIGET and in other groups, including the trial with the lentiviral vector in the ADS kit um, of Don Kong and, and uh, in London, that shows use a viral promoter. So I don't think that that makes a difference in general. It may have made a difference in the WASP. Uh, and indeed, with the Geniton people, we tried different promoters, uh, reduced length promoters, 0 0.5 kb, and we decided to go for the 1.6 because we saw some level of regulation. And again, it could be uh, important for WASP, but in terms of the safety of the lentiviral vector, I don't think that that's the reason. Thank and you. actually, Eugenio Montini really showed that, that the profile of the integration of the lenti is a safer profile. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, if not, uh, thank you again for the fabulous presentation. And